Good evening. I'm Dr. George Westlake from Sheffield Family Life Center in Kansas City, Missouri, and this is Living Answers for Today. We're here to answer questions about the Word of God to help with problems that you might be facing in the Christian life, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, to let you know that He Himself is the answer to the complex problems of eternal life, complex problems of life today. He is the way to God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. And if you don't know him, he's going to be knocking at the door of your heart tonight to come in and share his abundant life with you. Again, this is a live Bible question and answer program. A lot of questions have already been sent in by email. But if you happen to be watching this on Facebook, why well, you can put your, and you have a live question tonight, you can, you can actually write it in the comment section in the comments section of Facebook. And I'm not looking at the screen, but it'll be copied here in the, uh, here in the room and handed, and then handed to me. And we will insert the live questions between the ones that have already been sent in. I love answering live questions. I love answering those that aren't nice. I just love talking about the word of God. You know, when I first got saved, when I was 19, when I met Jesus Christ, oh, I'd been religious been going to church, but I met Jesus Christ when I was 19. And I would come home from work at the General Motors building in Detroit. I was an office boy at the time. I would come home and I would, and I would sit down and start reading the Bible. And a lot of nights I got zero sleep. I don't know how I did it. I got so excited just reading this book. It just made me come alive as I read the story of Jesus. And then the comments about how to live the Christian life. And I'd never heard it preached. All I heard, the only thing I ever heard about the Bible in the church I was attending, the pastor would read a few scriptures and say, and now my God, it is blessing to the reading of his holy word. That's all we ever heard about it. Heard lectures on fear and pop psychology and that kind of thing. And, but when I met Jesus Christ and started reading this book, I'd holler at my mother, hey, he walked on water. Hey, he took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 men beside women and children. And I hadn't been reading a week or maybe two weeks till I told my mother, if I read this right, he's coming back. I'd never heard that. And God sent me a good Baptist brother, and I asked him, is he coming back again? He said, yes. Well, I started looking for him when I was 19 years old. I'm still looking. I'm 88, and he's still coming in such an hour as you think not. And he makes it very clear in his word, you can't set a date. He said, it's not for you to know or to live as men and women expecting our Lord. But we see Bible prophecy taking place at warp speed. Many of us have said for years, the mark of the false teacher, the mark of the false God, the Antichrist when he comes on the scene will be something put into the skin. And we've said a microchip for years. And now you notice they're already talking about a microchip to control the pandemic and to keep track of people. It's being talked about on Facebook. Bill Gates and others have a lot to do with it and the government may be demanding it. And, and the things that the Bible talked about centuries ago, a lot of them are taking place right now. Now, we're not, we're not in the events of the book of Revelation yet, but things are shaping up. And a lot of the events described in Matthew 24 have been happening. And so we'll be discussing some of that. We've got some of those questions. But I'm going to go right ahead and start answering the questions. I mentioned last week I didn't get time to answer this one, so I mentioned I'd, I'd actually use this one the first this week. I says, can you explain Matthew 25, the 10 versions, the five and the wise foolish? Now, again, many of you know I hate the chapter divisions in the Bible. I tell you, when you read the Bible, to read it a book at a time, ignoring the chapter divisions and the verses, they were added in the Middle Ages to help people find scriptures and, the, and to make it possible to keep track of scripture. But it often interrupts the content and the flow of what the word of God is having to say. Remember, these originals had no chapters, no verses, one continuous, continuous story. And so it's important we read that. You can't isolate Matthew 25 from Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, the disciples asked three questions. Jesus indicated them Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, including the temple. They said, when will this be? What will be the sign of your coming? He used the Greek word parousia when used by itself without modifiers. He's talking about the event we call the rapture of the church and the end of the age. The end of the age takes place at the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so 
you know, because Matthew was the gospel to the Jew, he's more concerned about what, what happens to Israel, very concerned because he's presenting Jesus Christ as the king, promised king of Israel. And so a lot of his gospel is arranged topically. And Matthew answers the last question first, the end of the age. Why? Because during the last three and a half years of what's called the day of the Lord or the great tribulation period, a seven-year period, Israel will finally recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. You read in the book of Revelation and Daniel that the Satan will try to destroy them after that time. Michael and his angels will come on the scene and fight for Israel. And you can read Daniel 12 and Revelation 12. It's the same event, except Daniel says it's for the end of the age. It's either two or three times in chapter 12. Okay, of his book. And so we read about it in the book of Revelation as taking place the last three and a half years of the seven year period. Then he deals with the parousia, with the rapture of the church. Okay. And, and he says, as it was in the days of Noah, that's going to take place. In other words, they'd be eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, knew not till the flood came, took them all away. So shall also the parousia of the son of man be when he comes back for his church at the rapture of the church. Two will be in the bed. It actually says one will be received alongside of him. Two will be grinding at the mill. One will be received alongside of him. Then he goes on to warn that he's coming as a thief in the night. Now, Matthew 25 starts out then, meaning at that time. So he's still dealing with the event we call the rapture of the church and what's to immediately follow it. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. He doesn't say suppose virgins. He says ten virgins who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise. Five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps but took no oil. Now, oil all the way through the Bible is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, okay? When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy, you're born again by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit. You're a child of God. In other words, you know that you're saved, that you've met Jesus Christ. So oil always represents the Holy Spirit, both Old and New Testament. And they took no oil. The wise took their lamps, but took oil in their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, waiting, when's he coming back? They all slumbered and slept. You know, it's not just part of them. They all went to sleep. At midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto him, give us of your oil, for literally our lamps are going out. Something had happened to their their anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. But the wise answered and said, no, lest there be not enough for us and you. Go to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went with him into the wedding. Afterward came the other virgins and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Lord is coming. And again, Jesus said, it's not Freud or know the chronos nor the kairos, how much time is going to pass, nor the appointed time. You receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not a firm believer. I, I know if you watch the program at all in unconditional eternal security. There are too many warnings in the Bible written to Christians about the possibility of walking away from God. Uh, and the most often asked questions when I did this on live television for 24 years, the most often asked question was, can you lose your salvation? That's the most often asked questions I'm getting now. Can you lose your salvation? It's not like, oops, I lost it. But you can deliberately walk away from it. It can be like the prodigal son that said, I'm going to leave my father and house. And when he came back, the father said, this, my son was dead and is alive again. The warnings in the Bible. And this is one of those warnings. Why is the Holy Spirit running out? What's happening to them? We're not told. We're told in, we're told in the letters. You know, the letters, you know, that Paul wrote and others are to actually tell us how to apply the words of Jesus to our lives. And he often talks about putting away your former manner of living and putting on the new man, actively cooperating with the Holy Spirit. When you receive Jesus Christ, God doesn't make you a robot. You still have a free will. How do we live for God? 
the Holy Spirit of God will guide us. And when he talks about as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the children of God in Romans chapter 8. He's talking about day by day direction of the Holy Spirit of how to live for God. Now, the Bible gives us direction. The Holy Spirit gives us 24 hours a day direction. If we go to do something we used to do and we shouldn't do it anymore, the Holy Spirit will check us. We still have a free will. But if you make up your mind not to do it and take the step in the right direction, he gives you the power to put it into practice. And if he wants you to do something, he will instruct you to do it. And you'll feel a strong desire to do it. You might feel you can't, but when you take the step to do it, he gives you the power to put it into operation. So you have to keep oil in your lamp. So something was causing them to lose that. And then by the time he came, apparently they didn't have any. It was too late. And it's the same way in the Sermon on the Mount. He says there's going to be those that day and say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and do many wonderful works? He said, I never knew you. Why? Christianity is a relationship. And that's what he says here to them. I don't know you. He doesn't say here, I never knew you. He says, I don't know you. Why? Because they had chosen not to keep oil in their laps, not to have fresh oil, not to keep that anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, not to live as God wants them to live. And again, there's several warnings in the Bible. And God doesn't waste his breath to put a warning. One person actually said these warnings are in the Bible in case it could happen, but it can't happen. Well, God doesn't do things that way. He does give us warning. But the main emphasis of the Bible is if you want to be kept, God will keep you. If you make up your mind to serve God, there's not a situation, not a devil in hell or a person on earth can stop you from living for God. Only you. Nobody else can do that. You have the choice whether you're going to live for God or not live for God. You make up your mind, you can live for God. You make up your mind, receive Jesus Christ. Maybe you've tried before, do it again. Make a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. He is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the throne of his glory. He's able to keep, Paul says, he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. But you have to leave it committed to him. You can't pull it back, all right? And so that, that that's the foolish virgins. The Holy Spirit was gone, all right? Now, why is the order of Jesus calling his disciples different in some of the Gospels? Well, you know, Mark's not hardly concerned. He just barely mentions it. Luke doesn't mention it at all. And John actually mentions a meeting with that. Uh, 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 he actually mentions the first meeting with, you know, the first four apostles. He mentions the first meeting about six months before he actually called them to follow him. Okay. And that's why it seems to be a different. And, you know, he met, you know, he met two of them first. All right. And they decided to follow him. And then he goes by and he sees them fishing a few months later and he calls them and they, and they begin to follow him then. And the opening part is in John where he just gets acquainted with them, but he, they don't follow him at that time. And you don't have the others being involved yet. And then Matthew and Mark talk about the others a little bit later. Okay. So, so I wanted to mention that. That's the, that's the difference. And Luke doesn't even bother to tell us when. Okay. He doesn't bother to tell us when all that happened. Uh, does Armageddon occur before the thousand years? Is Armageddon the last battle to take place? Well, Armageddon is described in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, which is when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That actually is the theme of the book of Revelation, which says, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. And John says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's Revelation 1 7. That's the primary theme of the book of Revelation. Now, actually, the name of the book of Revelation is the first sentence in the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the word revelation means an unveiling or revealing. There are 26 different pictures of Jesus just in the book of Revelation. Okay, 26 pictures of Jesus just in the book of Revelation. And here in Revelation 19 is the battle of Armageddon that, that talks about the end of the age. And we start reading here in verse in verse 11 of chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Okay. And, I, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he does judge and make war. 
His eyes are as a flame of fire. On his head were many diadems. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, clean and white. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. They shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In other words, you have all the armies of the world that are gathered in the Valley of Megiddo. Now, the Valley of Megiddo runs from about 70 miles north of Jerusalem. It's the deepest depression on the face of the earth. That's where the Dead Sea is, which is about, I mean, it's almost 1,200 feet below sea level. And that depression, the Rift Valley runs all the way down and cuts across Africa in the middle of Kenya, the longest, the longest deepest depression on the face of the earth. And the only, you can imagine the armies of this world gathered to make Jesus known, blossom out of the sky when he comes back. The very day of Armageddon is going to be known. It's not an unknown day. The rapture of the church is an unknown day. The beginning of the day of the Lord. That's the only two events that we're told come as a thief in the night. We call the rapture of the church and the beginning of the day of the Lord come as a thief in the night. This is the climax, okay? This is the climax of the seven-year period here. And so they, they know the very day. So the armies will be gathered in the Valley of Megiddo to make war against him when he comes back have our multi-nuclear warheads, even probably have our satellites aimed that direction. And the only weapon mentioned on our side is the two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. He just has to speak the word. And it'll be all over. Okay, it'll be all over. It'll be done. It'll be finished. And I saw an angel stand in the sun. He cried with a loud voice. This is from, it's actually a quote from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 39 cried with a loud voice, saying, All the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come, gather yourselves to the supper of the great God that you meet, the flesh of the captains, of the flesh of mighty men, of the flesh of horses, them that sit on the flesh of all men, both small and great. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Okay, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. That just says the beast was taken. Just that simply, all these multi-nuclear warheads in the army, the beast is taken. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles, which he had deceived them, received the mark of the beast, and that worshipped his images, both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstones. And the word actually says lake or pond of fire, the body of water surrounded by land. It can be a lake, it can be a river, but it's actually surrounded by land, so it can't be a flowing river. And the rest were slain with the sword of him that sits on the mouth. And then Satan is cast into the abyss for a thousand years, bottomless pit, well pit of the abyss. Now, this is, uh, this is the last battle of this age, okay? The last battle of this age. Now, there's another battle after the thousand-year reign of peace, but it's not really a battle, okay? There isn't any army involved. And, but this is the last one we would call a real battle. Is coronavirus, COVID-19, a pandemic? I got that word wrong, didn't I? Is COVID-19, a pandemic, a judgment from God, a sign of the end of the world? No, not the end of the world, the end of the age maybe, but Matthew 24, let's go back there again. That's what we were asked. Jesus talked, I talked about things like this in Matthew 24 when they asked him and and let me start reading. Uh, let me just read. Uh, I'll start with verse four. Take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. There are many false Christs. <laughs> they don't say false Jesus. They say false Christ. I've got the answers. And they shall deceive many. You shall hear wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled for all these things must come to pass for the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation kingdom against kingdom, famine, diseases, and earthquakes in various places. These are the beginning of birth pains, okay? Beginning of birth pains. And he's telling the Jewish Christians here on Mount, well, he's on the Mount of, uh, he's in the temple area, okay? They shall deliver you to be afflicted, will kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And so that's the time. But he says these are the beginning of birth pains. 
Now, now he, then, then he goes on to describe the end of the age, and he comes back to the rapture of the church of Parousia because he's more concerned, Matthew, again, because of his topical arrangement in many places. And so it's the beginning of birth pains. Uh, when I was in Singapore last time, I was actually watching the news, and one of the newscasters was saying, why are there so many more tsunamis and hurricanes and earthquakes and these kind of things going on? I was sitting there saying, yes, the beginning of birth pains. He says, we see so many things all at once now, and that's absolutely true. When I was in Fiji just a couple of years ago, the biggest cyclone south of the equator in all of recorded history. Okay, we had 200 mile an hour winds. And all these things are taking place all at once now, all at once. They're increasing all at once. And so it's the beginning of birth pains. But then the, the other events are going to happen. When the birth pain starts, you know the baby's on the way. Baby's on the way. Okay. Uh, did Adam have a choice of whether to sin or not, or was he predestined by God? Are our choices determined by our DNA and our environment? No, our choices are determined by us. That's the thing. God gave us a free will. And that's what Adam and Eve had to use. Why did God create people? He gave us a free will if he knew we were going to sin, which he did. Because Jesus is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, we're told. God planned to send Jesus before Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden. Now, that's not predestination. That's foreknowledge. God knows what decision we're going to make, but we are responsible for our own decisions. I know there's a group of people that treat you that God's predestined. You really don't have a choice. I act I have a friend that asked the pastor, why do you preach then if they're automatically predestined to heaven? He said, well, I have to be sure I find those that are predestined. Why? If they're predestined, they're going to get there anyway. Okay, why even bother with it? And, and, but that's not the issue because, because God knows. The Bible says twice in the New Testament, God's not willing that one soul should perish. It's not his will that anyone up, end up in hell. Then why did he give us a free will? Because love has to be by choice. And I mentioned a proverb last week. It's actually in Proverb 15, 8. The prayer of the upright is God's delight. In the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom, the shepherd bride, I know the shepherd king says to his bride, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice for your face is beautiful and I love your voice. In other words, he loves it when we come into his presence and wait on him and have a relationship with him. That's why he created life. And that's why God created you. That's why you have life to know him and you have the choice to make up your mind if you want to know him or not. You see, the biggest thing about us, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've traveled everyone to his own way. God just butt out, leave me alone, want to run my own life. And God calls that sin. So he can't let us into his presence. He has to punish that sin because he's holy. That's why Jesus was born. God sent, God has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At a point in time, God the Son became that helpless baby. 100% God, 100% man. Isaiah prophesied at 700 years before, unto us a child, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, call his name Emmanuel, which means literally with us God, or in English, God with us. 100% God, 100% man. Lived without sin for 30 years, 33 years. So God could put all of your sin, all of my sin on him and punish him in our place. And he did it willingly because he loves you. If you'd have been the only one that sinned, God would have done that just for you, and Jesus would have done that just for you. Everyone you meet, if you're a Christian, Jesus died for them too, and you're the one to carry the message of truth. God leaves us here to be a witness. You're the light of the world, whether you want to be or not. You're a city set on a hill, okay? And it's up to you to share Jesus Christ. You don't have to be able to quote a dozen scriptures. Give your testimony. That's what Paul did when he stood before kings. Invite them to go to church with you. You want to see your church grow? As I've said for over 40 years, pastors don't grow churches. Congregations grow churches. 
by inviting other people to come and hear their pastor preach. Take someone with you to your church. I know a lot of the churches are open now. We are. A lot of the churches are open. Take your friend or invite them to tune in, to come to your house and watch your pastor on the web. Whatever's going on right now, that they might come to know Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. Okay, Jesus died for every single person. The last message of the Bible, Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that hears say, come, let whosoever, let him that is thirsty come, and whosoever will. That means whosoever will exercise his or her will, come and drink of the water of life freely. God knows, but he does not predestine. Now, the Bible teaches he has a predestined plan for those that are in Christ. We make the decision whether we're in Jesus Christ or not, okay? When you're in Jesus Christ, you become one of God's, one of, one of God's elect and one of God's chosen. God has chosen those that are in Christ. You have the choice whether you're in Christ. So God didn't predestine Adam to sin, but he knew he was going to sin. And he, he knew all about it. That's why he planned for Jesus to come before the foundation of the earth. How can God's omnipresent, that means the fact that God is everywhere, okay? How can God's omnipresence be consistent with theophany? Now, theophany is when God appears as a man, okay? God appearing to man? Yes, God always appears as a man. Now, Jesus said this in John's gospel, referring to the Father. No man has ever seen God at any time. Now, wait a minute. The Old Testament says do they frequently see God. Yes, they do. But let me finish the quote. No man has ever seen God at any time, referring to the Father, the unique one. And actually, the Greek text says the unique God, the one continuously existing in the bosom of the Father. He has revealed him, meaning every appearance of God in the Old Testament where people see God is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus as a man, okay? You recall the men came to see Abraham, and one of them said, I'm going to come on Abraham, and she's going to have a baby. That's when she was 90, and Abraham was 99. She was 89, Abraham was 99, okay? And, and an angel can't do that. Only God can give life. Only God can give life. Angels can't do it. And so... He, uh, he, he always appeared, appeared to Joshua as captain of the host of the Lord. He wrestled with Jacob, turned him into Israel, prince of God. When it was over, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, the face of God. I've seen the face of God and my life is preserved. He had. Who had he seen? God the Son. Says God walked with Adam in the cool of the garden. How? How did he walk with Adam and Eve? As God the God the Son came and walked with Adam, a pre-incarnate form was only temporary each time. But 2,000 years ago, he took permanently, God the Son took permanently the form of a man. When you see Jesus in heaven, he will still be 100% human, 100% God. Resurrected body, body that could walk through walls. I've told people I can't wait for my resurrection body to walk through my first wall kind, kind of facetiously. Hey, we just had this one. Handed in him. What happened to the people that rose from the dead when Jesus rose and walked on the streets of Jerusalem? I wish we knew. Anything I say would be speculation, but let me tell you the alternatives. Uh, what the Bible teaches when people died, you know, before the resurrection of Jesus, they went to Sheol in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's called Hades. It's not the grave, it's the place where the dead go when they die. I know the King James Bible, one train. Uh, in one place, it translates the word Sheol as grave. And it quotes Jacob saying, I'll go, I will go to my son Joseph to the grave. No, he said, I will go to him to Sheol. He thought Joseph had been eaten alive by a wild animal. And yet he said, I will go to Sheol to him. Now, the equivalent in the New Testament is Hades. All right. And Hades was, you know, Jesus explained it. The rich man and Lazarus, a parable or story. Rich man and Lazarus, they both died. Lazarus was the guest of honor to feast. He was in Abraham's bosom, meaning he was the guest of honor to feast. Recall at the Last Supper, John said on the right hand of Jesus. I know it says John was leaning on Jesus' bosom. He was on the right hand of the host of the dinner or the guest of honor at the feast. And 
And then Lazarus was in, the, was in Abraham's bosom, and Abraham lived about 2,000 years before that, okay? And the rich man was in torment in the same place. They could see each other, but there was a great gulf fixed in between. When Jesus died, he said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He told the thief on the cross, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And so for three days and three nights, Jesus was there. When he resurrected, he emptied the paradise side of Hades. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I knew a man that was brought up to paradise. I knew a man, I knew a man that was caught up to paradise. And, and, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I knew a man that was caught up to paradise. Paradise had been moved. So those that were in the paradise side of Hades were resurrected. Now, we don't know if they all went to heaven. We know some walking in the streets of Jerusalem after the resurrection of Christ. We're told that in Matthew's gospel. Okay, a lot of the dead people were seen that had died were seen walking in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, we're not told what happened to the rest of the people. They probably went straight to heaven then, or, or, okay? And, uh, and then Jesus ascended 40 days later. All right, so we don't know what happened to those that were seen in the streets of Jerusalem. If they happened to ascend when Jesus did, or if they were just seen temporarily and they were caught up, we just don't know. We're not told. So anything we, see, anything we say is speculation. There's no answer given in Scripture. But, 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 but we're not told they were ever seen again. We're not told any of them were still hanging around. We just said they were seen walking in the streets of Jerusalem. So apparently, and I'm saying apparently, they were caught up sometime into the presence of God. Now we know now when Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He meant, among other things, that those that know me and how to become part of the church by receiving Jesus Christ, not by signing a certificate, okay, by receiving Jesus Christ. And when you receive Jesus Christ, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So we don't, the gates of Hades never close around the members of his church. And again, his church is his body. Those that have received Jesus Christ, those, those that know him are his church, not the organization. Those that know him. It's not the sign over the door. It's the sign over your heart that makes a difference. Okay. And so we, uh, I know. Uh, if I have a heart attack right now, that's why Jesus said, whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Close my eyes here, open them in the presence of God. Still have life. Still have life. You will too if you know Jesus Christ. Is Romans seven fourteen to 25 describing a believer or an unbeliever? Uh, Romans is actually Paul's description of what it means to try to be saved by keeping law and you can't isolate these verses from Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 8. And let me encourage all of you to read Romans 6, 7, and 8 together, ignoring the chapter divisions and ignoring the verse division. In chapter 6, Paul makes several amazing statements. One of them is this. You used to be the slaves of sin. Now you're the slaves of righteousness, okay? You used to be the slaves of sin. Now you're the slaves of righteousness. Okay. Then in now, now in chapter seven, he starts out saying this. Don't you know, brother, and I speak to them that know the law. That's verse one. How the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now don't stop reading there. That verse has been misused. For the woman that has a husband is bound by the law. Now he's talking about people trying to live by the Old Testament law. She is bound by the law to her husband as long as her husband lives. If her husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. He goes on to explain if she be married to another man, according to the law, she'd be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, then she's not an adulteress. And then the conclusion of this argument is verse 4. Wherefore, my brothers, we are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that should we be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So he's saying you're no longer under the law. Now he goes on to explain what happens when you try to live by the law. And notice verse 9, 5. I'm not going to take a long time on this. It would take the whole rest of the time. When we were in the flesh, past tense, Romans 8 is going to say you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of Christ lives in you. 
That's why you must take six and eight together. Paul is describing his life as a man trying to be saved by keeping law. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, were working in our body to bring forth fruit on the death. So he describes trying to live by keeping the law. And basically what he says is the things I want to do, I can't do. And the things I know I shouldn't do, I do. I'm absolutely powerless. Oh, I'm carnal. I'm sold under sin. What does it mean to be sold under something? To be the slave to it. And Paul has already said in chapter 6, you are no longer the slave of sin. So he's talking to people that are trying to be saved by keeping law. You can't be saved by keeping law. As the book of Galatians says, to be saved by keeping law, you have to keep it 100%. And that's only per, only one person ever lived that did that, and that was Jesus. If you broke one part of the law, you're a lawbreaker. If you ever sassed your parents, you're a lawbreaker. If you ever didn't put God first in your life, you're a lawbreaker. If you ever put a little itsy bitsy teensy winsy lie, you're a lawbreaker. And I could go on and on and on. You got to be keep it a hundred percent. You can't. You're under the curse of the law, it says in Galatians. Christ became the curse for us on the cross of Calvary. Bore the curse of the law. Okay, that was on everyone. And so he goes on to say, well, with my mind, I serve the law of God. In other words, I know what I should do, but my flesh, I keep saving the law of sin. But then you get to Romans 8. What the law couldn't do in those weeks through the flesh. The law said don't, but gave me no power to quit. The law said do this, but gave me no power to do it. God sending his own son in the likeness of flesh of sin and in behalf of sin, judged against sin in the flesh, that the moral principles, the righteousness of the law, not the letter, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Why? The law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. Okay, you have a new law, the law of the spirit of life on the inside. And he, that's when he goes on to say, if you have the spirit of Christ, you're no longer in the flesh. And all the arguments of Romans chapter 8, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the strong desires of the flesh, as it says in Romans. Walk in the spirit, listen to the spirit. Okay, so you're, you're a new person in Christ. So you have to take seven in connection with six and eight. The chapter divisions can destroy the argument. The chapter divisions can destroy the presentation. Again, let me encourage you to read the Bible a book at a time. And that's what I had to do in Bible college back many years ago, and I'm glad I learned to do it that way. Even when we took the Pentateuch, Genesis with its 50 chapters, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, one semester we had to read each of those books 50 times. Each time had to be at a single sitting. You couldn't count it if you got up to go away or you got up to go somewhere. You had to read it at a single sitting, 50 times each of those books in one semester, in one class. Okay? But we know we knew those books when it was finished. Same way today. Take a book of the Bible, read it like a newspaper several times, then go back and study it verse by verse and chapter by chapter. But that's what happens. We separate separate and we can't separate these discussions again you can send live questions in in the comment section of facebook if you so choose uh, revelation 18 is babylon symbolic of the world is the original city of ancient times i'm confused now it's both but it's not today in other words babylon today is not the babylon of the ancient thing and actually babel began with a, a man by the name of nimrod and uh, he established Babel, and he established it, uh, oh, oh, how does it say, literally in your face, God. Uh, he indicated he was a hunter. I'm a hunter in your face. I'm a hunter before God, meaning a hunter in your face. And he actually established, he actually, he actually established what was called Babel in the book of Genesis. Now, next time we read about it was in the Tower of Babel. Revelation uh, uh, in in the book of Genesis. Okay, I read about the Tower of Babel and what happened at the Tower of Babel. God said, "Fill the earth." They said, "No, we're going to build us a tower whose top will reach to heaven, lest God scatter us on the earth." Became man's organized rebellion against God. If you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter fourteen, he starts talking about the king of Babylon two hundred years before the Neo Babylonian Empire. And yet, then he immediately goes to, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, angel of the morning? Man's organized rebellion under Satan against God. 
Egypt. And then Babylon was against Israel. Babylon was against Israel. When you get to the New Testament, okay, Babylon represents the whole world system. It says in Revelation 14, Babylon has fallen, Babylon has fallen. As you go on and read the book of Revelation, you will find there is political Babylon, religious Babylon, and commercial Babylon. Political Babylon is the 10-nation confederacy under the man called the Antichrist. Both Daniel and Revelation bring this out. You can read Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation 13. It's talking about the same group, okay? Now, and you can also read Revelation 17. Uh, and the statement Babylon has fallen. You have political Babylon that's ruled by the man called the Antichrist or the instead of Christ. The one Israel is going to accept for the first three and a half years of the seven year period as the Messiah. Okay. And then secondly, you have the false prophet who will cause the world to worship the Antichrist and control the commerce. The false prophet is the religious system. And in order to be able to buy or sell, you have to receive from the religious system the mark or the name or the number of the beast. Now, the mark of the beast is a schisma in or un under the skin. Okay, you're talking about the chip, the mark of the beast, okay, when he comes on the scene. But it's connected with the worship of the man called the Antichrist. All right. It's not the mark itself. It's the purpose for the mark, purpose for the mark. And you have that. And then you have commercial Babylon, the buying or the selling, the world monetary system. In, Re in Revelation 17, religious Babylon is destroyed. In Revelation 18, commercial Babylon is destroyed. The whole commercial system of the world falls apart. And in Revelation 19, I've already read the Battle of Armageddon, political Babylon is destroyed. Babylon is destroyed. Babylon is destroyed. Jesus Christ comes on the scene to rule as king of kings and lord of lords for the next thousand years. Now, why would Jesus rule on earth for a thousand years? To fulfill the promises God gave to Israel, to complete the promises of the Old Testament. I remind you, the prophecies of the Old Testament are like skyrockets. They go bam, 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 here, there, everywhere. It takes the New Testament and the book of Revelation specifically to put them all together. The book of Revelation puts these prophecies all together, where they belong, and the order that things are going to happen. Without the book of Revelation, we would not know how it's going to end. It's almost it's impossible to put things together without the book of Revelation. And I think a lot of the false teaching is because people try to do it without the book of Revelation. It's chapter 66 of God's story. That's why I called my latest book chapter 66. And it's written very simply. I wasn't planning on saying anything about it, but had I have a lot of questions that seem to do with that area. Uh, I actually started. I actually started as. I actually started as a serious student of Bible prophecy when I was 23 or 24. I'm 88 now. I've been studying it seriously. Taught the Book of Revelation in colleges all over the world, and I'm a firm believer that what God says is what's true. I have no apologies for believing the word of God from cover to cover. And the book of Revelation puts prophecy together. And this is the way I teach the book of Revelation. It isn't like a textbook that examines all the different viewpoints and all the different ideas. It puts the prophecies of the Old Testament where they fit into the story of the book of Revelation. And I've tried to write it simply. It follows the outline of Revelation. Okay, It follows the chapters of Revelation. And it's called Chapter 66, The Revelation of Jesus Christ Simply Explained. It's available on eBay. And I really appreciate the comments I've been getting about the book from scholars and also from pastors and various other people around this country and actually around the world. And it's available on eBay. And I, and I guarantee you'll understand the book of Revelation if you use that. But you need to read the book of Revelation several times and then take the textbook and go through it chapter by chapter. It's not technically a textbook. I'm a pastor, and I've been a pastor for the majority of 60 years in my ministry. And, and there's a lot of inspirational stuff in it that God has given me, a lot of practical application of the truths there. I can't do that. 
I mean, I can't write without doing that. I can't talk without doing that. Some people have said I almost start preaching sometime on this program, and, not, and that's not the intent of it, is to teach, but, but, but I get carried away sometime with this truth. Uh, do we see the Antichrist before the second coming? Now, uh, let me explain. The second coming is not a biblical phrase. It's not a biblical phrase. That's a phrase of theologians. Jesus comes first for the rapture of the church. They're caught away. The Antichrist makes his appearance and the seven-year tribulation. We will not see the Antichrist until after the rapture of the church. Now, if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, God, Paul gives the outline. And I'm not going, I'm not going to go into great detail. But he actually says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that sleep through Jesus, or that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then the sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, those that have died are in the presence of the Lord. And the Bible doesn't teach soul sleep. Again, it says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Paul said in Philippians, for your sakes, I'd rather stay here. But as for me, I want to take down this tent and depart and be with Christ. And that's much rather better. Okay, so if we close our eyes here, we open them in his presence. Jesus died for the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. So those that have died in Christ, he's coming back, and they're coming with him to pick up a glorified body. Now, it goes on to say, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. For the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need that I write unto you. For we know the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, the parousia, the rapture, will come as a thief without warning. Okay? And the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, a surveil upon a moon with child, and they shall not escape. And he goes on to say, God has not appointed us to wrath to, to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I hate the chapter division. I quoted from 4 and 5 of that. And that's in 1 Thessalonians, which was Paul's first letter. Now, not long after that, the persecution was, you know, by the Jews of the Christians was going on, and there were some Romans supporting. There were, and actually, the main Roman persecution came later. The initial was from the Jews. And reading Second Thessalonians, they thought that, that this was the day of the Lord. They thought they'd missed the parousia, the catching away. And someone said the person, what we're going through is the day of the Lord. Uh oh what happened? We missed the parousia. And apparently someone even sent him a letter and signed Paul's name to it. This is the day of the Lord. And he said, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the parousia, that's the rapture, the coming of the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the coming of the Lord and by our gathering together unto him, is what should take place at the rapture, that you stop being shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word or by letter supposedly from us, that the day of the Lord is here. That day will not come till the apostasy and the man of sin makes an appearance. The word there is revelation. He will be like a sudden revelation on the scene when? After the parousia. And I'm not going to the whole description there. But what he is saying is the fact that you don't see the man of sin, the Antichrist, means you haven't missed the catching away. In the book of Revelation, the simple outline, he outlines the church in chapter 2 and 3. In chapter 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. The man of sin makes his appearance in Revelation 6 1. Okay, he, he's the one that comes up, he comes under the first seal when Jesus starts opening the seven seal book. Okay, he's coming. Andrew Murray was called the forerunner of, of Pentecostalism. In your opinion, what is his writing? Well, I haven't read any of his stuff for probably 50 years. He had some good points. You have to read anybody's writing. Uh, you know, read it with an open mind, but also read it with scripture in mind. And I don't really, to be honest, I actually read his material so long ago. Uh, I I actually don't remember the arguments, but I know he was highly respected by a lot of people. Uh, should we take injections for the for, for the co-advisors? I think that's between you and your doctor and you and the Lord. Uh, I think it depends on the, on the opinions of people. I'm 88. I don't take injections for anything like that. The only time I've ever had the flu was when I took the flu shot. I haven't had a flu shot in years and years and years. I've only ever had the flu shot three times, and I've had the flu three times. 
So I, so, so I don't take it personally, but I'm not going to give other people medical advice what to do. Okay, I just won't do that. I appreciate the question. Uh, I I know a lot of people are having trouble with the, I, I, you know, the implant that they're wanting to give people. And uh, the microchip. And they can keep track of you and all kinds of things like that with it. Well, they can keep track of you if you have a cell phone anyway. And almost, and who doesn't have a cell phone nowadays? And so they can keep track of you anyway. But, but a lot of people are afraid of the chip. It's not the chip itself. It's, it, it, there will be a chip in connection with the Antichrist. But it might be that by that time, we're already used to a chip. Okay, we're already used to it here because because that part doesn't seem to arise until close to the middle of the tribulation period, close to the middle of the seven year period. So, so this may be a forerunner just to get us ready for what's going to happen eventually, because the devil can read the book, too, can read the Bible, too. And God's God's in control, folks. God's in control. We don't have to get upset or worried. Like one author said, he's not wringing his hands over the pandemic. Okay, he knew all this was going to happen. He's in control. He's able to heal, by the way, able to heal. And so, so God will take care of us. I, I personally will not get a chip, okay, but I'm 88 years old, and I don't know what all is going to go on. And so make it a matter of prayer, but, 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 but don't get involved in any kind of worship with it. Because, but, but I think it will, it, uh, it has to be connected with the worship of the Antichrist to be something that will, you know, that God is against. Uh, does God's promise to Joshua and Israel in Joshua 1 9 apply to us? I don't think the word for word promise, but the principles are still the same. And you can read, uh, uh, let me. Turn over to Joshua 1 9. I can almost quote it, but I'd rather read it because I might leave a word or two out. Joshua 1 9. Now, the principle is still the same. Have I not commanded you be strong and of a good courage and don't be afraid? Boy, that's true. You know, God tells us to don't be afraid. Be still and know that I'm God. But it says be still and know that I'm God. He's not talking about quiet. He's talking about the, the absence of worry or concern or anxiety. Read the context. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, let me read verse. Uh, before he gives that promise in 1 9, as you all know, I hate to pull one verse out of context. So I'm going to start here. Oh, boy. Uh, he's talking, okay, Moses had died. Joshua was taking over. There shall not be any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Now, the fact that God won't forsake is for everybody, but we're not going to take Moses' place. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people you shall divide them for an inheritance of the land that I swear unto them their fathers to give them. We, we don't do that. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, uh, commanded you turn not from the left hand to the right hand, that you might prosper where you go. Now we have the law, the spirit of life in Christ in the inside. The book of the law shall not depart of your mouth. You shall meditate therein night and day that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then you'll make your way prosperous and have good success. We're not under that law anymore. The whole New Testament teaches that. Now, the moral principles of the law have been repeated in the New Testament for the Christian, but not the legalistic things, such as not wearing this or not dressing this way or not doing that, okay, or not or not building a fence around your roof. That's part of the law, too. You know, some people try to put one part of the Old Testament law on other people, but if you're going to put one part, you got to keep the whole thing. So build a fence around your roof, roof or you're breaking the law. Okay, or, or you can't eat, you can't eat pork and you can't eat shrimp. Uh, a whole lot of, oh, we're not under that law. The whole New Testament teaches that. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Don't be afraid. Now that part is true for all of us. That part of us is true, not the first part. The last part is true for all of us, one nine. 
because of other scriptures, not only because, and we can't say I claim the promise of Joshua, no, but we have other scriptures that tell us that God will be with us during these times. I have a friend that says the Bible teaches that the earth is flat, okay? The Bible teaches that the earth is flat. I quoted her Isaiah about God sitting on the circle of the earth, but she said that doesn't prove it isn't flat. It's just one of those mysteries we don't know. Hey, the book of Job, the oldest book known to man, says God hangs the earth upon nothing. He hangs the earth upon nothing, absolutely nothing. And I knew this question was in, and... I looked up a couple of the Greek words just to be sure, but it uh, the word, uh, you know, I've read this argument that the earth is flat. And they, and they go back to the ancient thing. The earth is sitting on a pedestal and there's a big dome around it. And then the stars and everything and the sun, the moon are set in that, in that dome. And the sun comes up and goes down. The sun comes up and goes down. But the book of Job says God hangs the earth on nothing. That's the oldest book known to mankind. God hangs the earth on nothing, okay? And one of the arguments they use is words like foundation. Well, the word foundation is used for the establishing of a truth. You know, Paul says when he goes to, when he goes to preach in Rome, he doesn't want to build on another man's foundation, okay? So, so, so it's, actually used for the, it's actually used for the establishment of a truth. It's actually used for the establishment of an organization, it's actually used for the beginning. And one of the words translated foundation is to throw something down. Okay, remember the word is kata. Uh, and my mind just went blank. I, you know, to cast it down. And uh, the casting down of the earth, the beginning of the earth, okay? It doesn't mean the earth is sitting on a foundation. Now, the Bible does use foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Context determines the meaning of the word. But then I was reading one of the discussions, and one of the discussions of people that claim the earth is flat. Number one, they say no matter where you go, you can see the North Star. No, you can't see it in the Southern Hemisphere. You can see it till you give it one and a half degrees south of the equator. Then you can't see the North Star anymore. You can see the North Star anywhere in the northern hemisphere because it's utmost north. You can see it. And when you get about one degree south of the equator from a high mountain, you can see it still. But you get a little further south of the equator, you cannot see the North Star. Why? Because the earth is round. And they're saying, well, it's some kind of a conspiracy to prove. What conspiracy makes a difference whether the earth is flat or round? Doesn't make any difference, okay? Uh, because the conspiracy will still come up. It's a, I read a book all trying to talk about a conspiracy with aliens and uh, because proving the earth is round, even taking pictures. No, 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 no. No, no. God is using earthly language to explain. He uses the word foundation of the earth, the founding of the earth, uh, the founding of the church I pastored for, for many years, okay, the founding of America. 1776, the founding of America. The word foundation is used the same way. The foundation of our government is the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. That's the founding of, that's the foundation of our government. And that's the word foundation is used. And then I heard a brother talk about the word firmament. Well, the fir word firmament means something solid. The earth is called the firmament. So he said it in the firmament of heaven, according to the Bible. Well, the King James uses the word firmament. The Hebrew word is, and actually the Hebrew word is shemayim, the expanse. New American Standard actually translates it. The expanse, the atmosphere, the heaven is where God set the stars and the sun and the moon. Not in something solid. And they make a big issue out of some of the words and some of the language. And uh, it doesn't make any difference if the earth is flat or round. But, the, but clearly, science is not wrong there. The earth is round. And again, Job says God hangs the earth on nothing. It's not sitting on a pedestal. And the word firmament is not anything solid. It's shemayim, the expanse. As I've explained when I talk about the flood, when God created the earth, he separated the waters above the expanse from the waters below the expanse. I'm going to use the word atmosphere instead of expanse. Okay? And God took a bunch of water and he put it all the way around the earth above the atmosphere. 
Now, what happens when water gets too high in the atmosphere? It crystallizes. So the whole earth was like a giant hothouse surrounded by this crystal. When the flood came, the fountains of the deep burst forth, including earthquakes, and God opened the windows of heaven, and all that water came crashing down, which would mean the poles would instantly freeze in the North and South Pole. That's why they have found elephants frozen in ice with fresh grass in their mouth, instantly frozen, instantly frozen, okay? And then when God got rid of the water, the, but the Psalms indicate God lowered the water basins and raised the mountains. Again, tremendous earthquakes, counting for all the so-called geological ages that they find. Imagine the earthquakes to, to get rid of all this water as God raised the mountains and lowered the water basins all over the world. It wasn't a local flood. It was worldwide. And uh, so the earth is round. The earth is round. The arguments are misusing language. Misuse, a word means what it means in the context where it is. The foundation of the world. Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Okay? Before the world was started. Before the world was started. And make an issue out of things that aren't... Uh, I just hate to see by... I just hate to see people misuse the word. What is the abomin abomination of desolation? And what are the main points to encounter preterism? The counter. The abomination of desolation, okay, is spoken of by Jesus, but it's spoken of by Daniel first. Uh, Daniel talks about the abomination that makes desolate. And you know, Daniel's prophecy was actually fulfilled by a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, let me turn over here to Daniel. Okay, Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azurius, the seed of the Medes, was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. First year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereby the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, who would establish 70, 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Now, why was Jerusalem, why were the people taken out of the land for 70 years? If you go back into the Old Testament, and you read what Jeremiah says, okay? And you read and you read Leviticus, and then also the last chapter of Second Last Chapter of Second Chronicles, the Bible teaches that you know, part of the law, when you come into the land, it's every seventh year you'll have to let the land rest. The land must have a Sabbath every seven years. The word Sabbath means rest. The land must have a Sabbath. You don't plant it, you don't harvest it. Every seven years. If you don't do that, I'm going to take you out of the land so the land can enjoy its Sabbaths. They had not done that for 70 times 7. That's why they were taken out of the land for 70 years. And Second Chronicles says, till the land would enjoy its Sabbaths of 70 years. So for 490 years, they had not done that, 70 sevens. Now, Daniel receives the prophecy that the King James Bible says 70 weeks. The Hebrew says 77s. Daniel is looking back at 77s in the past. Now, the angel tells him there are 77s in the future for Israel, for your people, Daniel, and your holy city, which is Jerusalem. All Bible prophecy centers around Jerusalem. All Bible prophecy centers around Jerusalem. 77s are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy, and anoint the holy of holies. Okay? There's, in other words, there's a 490-year period in the future. Then he breaks it down. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that's in Nehemiah 1 and 2, unto Messiah the ruler... Okay, Messiah the ruler, who's Messiah the ruler? Jesus, that will actually be 
69 of the 77s, he goes on to explain. Okay? And, in, and then he indicates after the 69 sevens, which would be 483 years, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. That's the crucifixion. The people of the prince that shall come, that's the Romans, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end shall be for a desolation. War is determined. He will confirm the key who will come. How the people of the prince that shall come, not the prince that shall come, will destroy the city. That took place in 70 A.D. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. All right? So the prince that shall come must come from Western civilization somewhere because there were, you know, our laws have the basis in Roman and all of Western civilization. And I can go into further explanation, but I can't take time on this to do that. Okay? But, but, but he must come from Western civilization. Now, he will be cut off for himself, the crucifixion of Jesus, then the prince that will come will destroy the city, and he, referring to the prince that shall come, will make a covenant with many for one seven. That's, a, that's all that's left, a seven-year period. In the midst of the seven, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. There's only one place the Jews can offer sacrifice. That is the temple in Jerusalem. So it must be built by the middle of the seven years covenant that the Antichrist will make with Israel. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate. Now, there was an abomination offered by a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes when he offered a pig on the altar in Jerusalem. But Matthew 24, Jesus used the same phrase and said it was still future. And speaking of the last three and a half years of the tribulation, in Matthew 24, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place that him that's in Jerusalem flee. Revelation 12 describes that fleeing at the middle of the tribulation period. So in the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will, will offer, a, he will put his image, according to Revelation, in the holy of holies in Jerusalem. Demand to be worshipped as God. That's when God's going to take the spiritual blinders off the eyes of the people of Israel, whether they live in New York City or Kansas City or Israel. Going to take the spiritual blinders off. And then Revelation 12 indicates what will happen to those that are in Israel, how they'll flee into the desert. I explain that more thoroughly in the book. Okay. Flee into the desert for three and a half year period. Going to Daniel 12 and Revelation 12. They're both the same event. Daniel 12 and Revelation 12 are the same event, identical, identical. You can read it for yourself. And again, Daniel says it's in the latter days, in the latter days. And so the abomination will be set up, and that's the abomination of desolation. It, it was when Antiochus offered a sow on the altar, but then Jesus said it was still future, a double fulfillment of prophecy. Now, we can't talk about double fulfillment unless the Bible does. You know, some people try to double fulfill everything, but it has to be only what the Bible does. What are the main points to counter preterism? Now, I'll briefly explain preterism. Preterism, they believe all prophecy ended in 70 AD. All prophecy ended in 70 AD. They put up some very heavy arguments. Now, a lot of my good brothers and sisters in Christ believe that. You know, we can disagree without, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And... Uh, you know, I have friends that are how they hold the opinion. They hold the opinion of preterism, but I, I know a brother that actually lost a job because he refused to be a preterist. Preterist, all prophecy fulfilled in seventy A.D. Um, it says we, the dead are caught up to meet in the air. It's a spiritual thing. We which are alive, we caught up to the Lord. It's purely, purely a spiritual thing, and it all took place in seventy A.D. There's no more prophecy for today. And then put out some of the weightiest arguments. Some of the weightiest arguments you've ever seen. Uh, there's one book just on First Thessalonians 4 that's about that thick. And they say, well, we have proven this has all taken place by 70. No, they haven't. You see what they do in their argument. They set up how it's called the horns of a dilemma. It either has to be this or this. But when we read the scripture, it might really be this or this or this or this or this. They say, well, it has to be this or this. Therefore, it's this. And then they say it has to be this or this when there might be this, 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 it's this or this, and they base everything on this. 
And they claim like the 70 weeks of Daniel, the 77s of Daniel, that all prophecy has to be fulfilled. I agree with that. I agree with that. But there's a seven-year period left in the book of Revelation, and that's still future. And they try to say, well, the judgment that came, this battle of Armageddon was only against the Jews that were persecuting the church because it was all involved with the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, they say the only death that matters is spiritual death and spiritual life. Physical death is irrelevant. Physical death is irrelevant, only spiritual death. Jesus died on the cross spiritually when he said, my God, have you forsaken me? That's right, he did, but he also died physically. And the physical resurrection all the way through the New Testament is the proof that Jesus is the son of God, okay? And so they say, well, he only died, but no, he died physically too. Well, the only death that matters is spiritually because when you die physically, you're with the Lord anyway if you're a Christian. And a lot of their arguments, they, they, they say, we've proven this, therefore this is true, but they haven't proven this. And just so many of the statements that are made, uh, the fact that Jesus will not be seen visibly when he comes back again, because God says all the way through the Old Testament, God says, I am coming to do this, I'm coming to do that, and God was never seen coming, therefore Jesus is just like his father, so he's not going to be seen coming. Well, then what are you going to do with the scripture when it says, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. And they also that's pierced him. What are you going to do when the angel said this Jesus, which is you see be caught up into heaven, will so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. You see, those kind of scriptures are ignored. They just ignore scriptures that seem to disagree with everything taking place in 70 AD. And in, as long as they hold that opinion, you're not going to convince them of anything. Good people love the Lord, have a relationship with him. But I think it is the most wrong interpretation of the book of Revelation and prophecy possible. And the way I see the biggest fault of it, they interpret the New Testament by scriptures from the Old Testament instead of letting the New Testament interpret the Old. The New Testament, remember, is the completion of the story. And I still agree with the statement and most Bible scholars agree with the statement. The new is in the old contained. Every truth in the New Testament is, is taught in the Old Testament in, in a different degree because the New Testament puts the finishing touches on it. But the old is by the new explained. And you can't explain prophecy how it's going to end without the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation puts it in order. So you do not interpret the book of Revelation by, by, by the Old Testament. You interpret the prophecies of the Old Testament by the book of Revelation. Okay. So you interpret the old by the new, not the new by the old. And I think they have it reversed. Good people that love the Lord. Okay. Uh, the tribulation period is for the Jews. But if a Gentile comes to Christ after the rapture, and dies of something other than taking the mark, will they still be saved by grace? Absolutely. People will be saved by grace all during the great tribulation period. You know, you read about the white robe multitude in Revelation chapter 7, and the messenger angel asked John, who are these and where do they come from? And John said, you know. He said, these are those, and he uses the present participle, these are those continuously coming out of the great tribulation. And it emphasizes the great tribulation, the tribulation, the great one. Continuously, there will be people saved all during the tribulation because the spirit of God will still be here dealing with people, still be here dealing with people, okay, drawing people to Jesus. And people will be saved, 144,000 of Israel are sealed in Revelation, 12 times 12, the perfect number, actually called the remnant in the Old Testament and also in Romans 9, 10, 11. Paul refers to the remnant of Israel who will accept Jesus Christ as Savior. And by the way, you must read Romans 9, 10, and 11 together. You can't read one of those chapters without the other two. Paul actually interrupts his arguing to talk about God's plan for Israel in the future, to let us know that God's not finished with Israel yet. And he's very strong in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And then he goes back to his discussion in 12, 1. And he says, therefore, uh, in Romans 12, 1, that goes all the way back to the end of chapter 8. Because he interrupts it with the discussion of God not finished with Israel yet. And so, yes, people will be saved all the way through the tribulation. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
and there will still be people that know the truth and the Holy Spirit will still be dealing with people. Uh, before the flood, how did they get water? Well, there were still bodies of water. You know, there were still bodies of water, streams and rivers. There were underground streams, underground wells, under green, underground rivers. That's why the Bible says the fountains of the deep burst forth, indicating earthquakes. Not that it just came forth, it burst forth, exploded. And there were earthquakes in, in the earth and then the fountain. And then all, all that water came crashing down. But they had water. They had water. They had streams. There was a river in the Garden of Eden. There was a river flowing through the Garden of Eden. And it had not been polluted yet, absolutely. Okay, there wasn't any pollution yet. And so there were rivers going. You read about the Garden of Eden. The river divided itself into four separate rivers. Okay. You know, two of them were the Tigris and Euphrates. Now, Uh, can you tell us about the prophets in Revelation? Well, we don't know much about them. They're just two Old Testament style prophets. A lot of people try to try to name them or try to try to say there are certain individuals. And uh, the uh, the interesting thing is in Matthew 17, where they said, uh, "Lord, uh, why do the prophets say Elijah has to come first? And they're actually basing that on the last chapter of the Old Testament, the last page of the Old Testament, as a matter of fact, last page of the Hebrew Scriptures. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the opening of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children of the fathers. Thus I come to smite the earth with a curse. And disciples asked Jesus, why do the why the scribes say Elijah has to come first. And Jesus said, Elijah shall come future, future tense. But I say unto you that Elijah has already come and they've done to him what they wanted to do. And it goes on to explain that they knew he was talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist fulfilled that scripture, Jesus is saying. Now, how did John the Baptist fulfill that scripture? You go back to Luke. Okay, when John the Baptist was born, Luke's chapter. And the angel Gabriel told Zachy, uh, I'm stammering. Hold. The angel Gabriel told Zacharias, he, John, will go before him, referring to Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elijah. Didn't say he's Elijah. In other words, he is the Elijah for this day, the spirit-filled Old Testament-style prophets. John the Baptist had been called the last of the Old Testament prophets. Well, there are two more, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. They will witness for three and a half years. The Antichrist will kill them after he's killed and resurrected. Their dead bodies will lay in the streets. People are going to give gifts to one another, thinking they caused the first three and a half years of all the problems that the earth has been having. And then they're, they're raised up and caught up to heaven. They finally realize it's God doing all this. And so they're just two Old, style, old Testament-style prophets. There's a false teaching that will have to be Enoch and Elijah because neither one of them died, and the Bible said it's appointed on the man who wants to die and after death the judgment. Well, what about the saints that are raptured at the rapture of the church? None of them are going to die. Millions of people aren't going to die. So why do Enoch and Elijah have to come back and buy? They don't. How do we know they don't already have their glorified bodies? We don't know that. We don't know what happened at the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, so, you know, maybe when they were caught up to heaven, they got glorified bodies. We don't know. But, but, but they don't have to come back and die any more than the raptured saints have to die. And so there's, and I was taught that when I was first saved. It has to be Enoch and Elijah. No, just two old style prophets. And actually they have the power of Moses and Elijah, if you read about the powers that they have. Uh, and that's in Revelation chapter 11. Can you talk about the seven seals? Well, the seven seals would take about an hour. <laughs> uh, I can talk about part of them. You have to understand what the seven seal book is. Uh, let me look. I think I'll start with that next week. I don't really think I'll have time, and I don't want to ignore those that sent these questions in ahead of time. But let me see how I can do with these. Uh, what is the tablet theory of Galatians? 
of the Genesis authorship and is it biblical? No. Uh, the, the, uh, it's a hypothesis called the Weissman hypothesis. Weissman lived in the 1800s and he claimed there were a bunch of tablets apparently that Moses copied that Abraham all the way from the time of Abraham they had left behind. There's no basis for that hypothesis whatsoever. No basis for that hypothesis whatsoever. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and take this question. Can you tell us about the seven seals? Since it was called in and I say I will squeeze those in. I think I've got time. I'm looking at the clock. I have about nine minutes. Uh, uh, what you see is the seven sealed book in the book of Revelation. Now, let me, let me remind you, a seven sealed book in the Bible is a scroll. And in Revelation 4, John is caught up to heaven. He sees God sitting on the throne, and he sees the four living ones, and he hears the multitude of angels, and he sees God sitting on the throne with a seven-sealed book in his hand. And the Bible says a strong angel cried, no man in heaven or earth is worthy to take the seals and loose their, uh, loose the, take the book and loose the seals thereof. And John said, I wept much. I cried much. Because why? No man could open the book. What's the importance, John? John understood what this book was by its nature. It was written on the inside and on the back side and sealed with seven seals. So it was closed up. What's on the inside could not be seen, and what's on the back side could be because it, it was on the outside. And John understood that this was an Old Testament mortgage deed. I mortgage my property. So it's written down on the document what I have to pay back to get my property, to receive my property. Then it's rolled up and sealed. There's one name on the outside, the name of my kinsman redeemer, my nearest relative. You recall Boaz was Ruth's kinsman redeemer. When he took her hand in marriage, he redeemed her property too. Okay. And so John understood what this was. This is an Old Testament mortgage deed. What was mortgage? You read the second chapter of Hebrews where Jesus is compared with Adam. God put everything under Adam's authority. Everything. All creation. Okay? When Adam and Eve sinned, Satan became the ruler of the cosmos. Sin and death and sorrow and pain. Man, Adam mortgaged man's inheritance. He understood the curse has been placed on creation itself. You know, you, people say you only die because you've sinned. Then why does your puppy die? What sin did he or she do? Why does your pet rosebush die? This whole creation is under a curse. Read it. Creation will be delivered from the curse, we're told. And so anything that's under, anything created will die. Anything created will die eventually. And so this curse, pain and sorrow and sin will continue until someone can open this mortgage and see how to give man back his inheritance. And so John is weeping. And one of the living ones says, stop your weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and offspring of David, has prevailed to take the book and loose the seals thereof. And I looked and I saw a lamb as it had been slain, having seven eyes and seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God. And he walks over and takes the book out of the father's hand. And you hear the great praise. You're worthy to take the book and loose the seals thereof. For you've redeemed us by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. Made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign upon the earth. And the great praise begins to ring out. And around that it says myriads times myriads of angels. Myriads the biggest number in the Greek language. In English the biggest number is a Googleplex. So Googleplex is times Google. Plexes of angels began to praise God. And then it says every created thing began to praise God. Why? Because the mortgage deed that brought ruin and death and sorrow and pain is about to be opened. And so I got to pick up my Bible because I dropped it on the floor. So I'm going to disappear for a second. Okay. And I, I get so excited about the word of God. And so Jesus starts to open the seven sealed book under the first seal, Revelation chapter six. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. I've mentioned before, the Antichrist makes his appearance. You have the imitation Christ. I've already read Revelation 19 earlier in the program. And here's the appearance of the imitation, the instead of Christ. The word ante means instead of. 
primarily. Okay. When the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder and one of the living ones say, go and then see. And I saw and behold a white horse. He's coming as the imitation. I remember he that sat on him had a bow. That's a bow and arrow, not a rainbow, a military weapon. A, a crown was given unto him. This is the Stephanos, the victor's crown, where we get our English word Stephen from. When Jesus comes, he has the diadems on his head, the diadema. And he went forth conquering and to conquer, which is what the Antichrist will do for the first three and a half years. He will go forth conquering and to conquer. Now we read all the details about it in Daniel and Revelation. He will rule through, a, he, he will rule through three nations, through three, he will rule 10, and through 10, he will rule the world. And when he opened the second seal, I heard one of the living ones say, go. See, there's a command to go for the horse, and there's his command for John to see. And another horse that was red, power was given unto him to take peace from the earth. They should kill one another, was given him a great sword. This may be the war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. There's no way to prove it, but it sounds like a war. And there's no way to pinpoint when Ezekiel 38 and 39 takes place. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third living one say, go, see, and behold, a black horse. He that sat on him had a pair of balances. That's a scale in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living front, a measure of wheat for a denarius. Now, a denarius in the Bible and in, and in prophecy and in parables, a denarius is a day's wage for one man. All right. And a measure of wheat is food for one man for a day. So it's going to take a day's wage to buy food for one. But you can buy three measures of barley for a denarius. So if all you want is flour soup, you can feed three people for a day's wage. And you, But don't hurt the oil and wine. Why? There's going to be worldwide famine. Why do you say don't hurt the oil and wine? They're considered luxuries. A Rolls Royce won't do you any good when you can't buy food for your family. It's not just local famine here. It's worldwide. Don't forget, all these plagues are worldwide. Okay, all these plagues are worldwide. Now, if you use a Dake's Bible, he tries to make them local. They are not local. These are worldwide. And when he had the fourth seal, I heard a living one say, go see. Okay. And there was a pale horse, which is actually chloros, yucky green. And we read cause all kinds of death. Let it. His, his name that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him. Hades followed with him. Now, now again, death and Hades are personified here. Followed him. Power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, with the beasts of the earth. So possibly 25% of the earth's population will be killed. We don't know. Now, we read later on under another plague under the under the last bowls, one third of the earth population that's left is going to die. You see, the great tribulation is not for the church. The great tribulation is the judgment of the wrath of God and also to draw Israel into a relationship so God can fulfill the promises he gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the way through the Old Testament. Okay. Uh, under the fifth seal, there's martyrs. Okay. And under the sixth seal, there's a great earthquake. And listen to this description. Look, when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The meteorites, or stars of heaven, it's the same word in the original, fell to the earth as a fig tree cast her untimely face when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And all of a sudden, the heavens will depart as a scroll. You see, they're going to believe the two witnesses are causing this up until this time. Because you read Revelation 11. Maybe I better say after chapter 10, everything that's written after chapter 11, everything that's written is inside the seven seal book. So he amplifies on a lot of these details. But there is no way that they could. Uh, there isn't any way. There isn't any way after this event in Revelation 6 that they believe the two witnesses were causing the problems. As you read in Revelation 11 that the two witnesses witnessed for three and a half years, okay, and when they get killed by the Antichrist, the world's so excited they give presents to each other because the two witnesses that tormented them day and night are finally dead. And after, 
after the opening of the sixth seal, they would never believe two people were doing it because they see straight through the throne of God. Read it yourself. And they say, fall on us and hide us from the, how the mountains fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne of the great day of his wrath is coming. Who shall be able to bear it? I got a question here. Is your new book the same as your older book? No, my older book on Revelation and Daniel, it's many years old. I actually wrote that for Global University, which is the world's largest Bible correspondence institute. And uh, in that, that one was a college textbook. So I had to examine all the different viewpoints and all the different ideas. And they took Daniel out and made it a separate book, which was better for their purpose. They have Daniel, the first part of the book, and then Revelation. This is the way I teach Revelation and Daniel. I put Daniel where it fits into the story of Revelation. I put Matthew 24 where it fits into the story of Revelation. Thessalonians where they fit into the story of Revelation. This is written in a simple language, and I'm not examining all the different opinions. This is my opinion and the way I teach it after studying it over 60 years. I've read somewhere between 150 and 200 books on Bible prophecy. I think I know most of the theories. There's always new ones coming about. By the way, there are no aliens in the Bible. Okay, always new ones coming out, always, always coming new ideas. But this is the way I see it after studying all these years and the way I've taught it for over 30 years in the college classroom. And I've had the privilege of teaching it all over the world. Okay, I go for two weeks at a time and I teach a master's level course on Revelation and Daniel. Uh, in some colleges, it's an undergraduate course, but most places where I go in Asia, they put them both together. You just have the you just have to give the graduate students more reading and so on and longer paper to do. But it's the way I teach it. And to me, it's the way it should be taught. But again, the purpose for Global University was to separate the two and examine all the different ideas, which I do not examine all the different ideas here. And I have a lot of devotional things included as we go through Daniel and Revelation. OK, and again, it is available on eBay, Chapter 66 by George Westlake, W-E-S-T-L-A-K-E, -E, Jr. All right. And I know it will be a blessing to you verse by verse. And again, I call it the revelation of Jesus Christ simply explained. That's available. I can't close without asking, do you know Jesus Christ? What if this what if he comes back today? What if you step into eternity today? Do you know Jesus? None of us have a promise for tomorrow, okay? He might come tonight, might not come for years, but prophecy is being fulfilled at warp speed. Who's he coming for? Those that know him. You recall what he said to the, the, end, the end of the Sermon on the Mount to those that, he's, that he has to send away? I never knew you. He said to the five foolish virgins, I don't know you. Not that I don't know about you or I never knew you. I don't know you. How do we know? How does he know us? But when we receive Jesus Christ. So if you need Jesus Christ, just pray this simple prayer. And I've seen people change lives change just praying this prayer at a funeral as a group or in a church service. Just pray this simple prayer. Dear Father, I know I've sinned. I ask you to forgive me in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I give you my life. I gave you everything I am, everything I hope to be. Save me right now. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you from now on. Help me to understand your word. Help me to find a good Bible-believing church. And help me to tell others about your love. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to remind you, the folks that attend Sheffield, we do have services on Wednesday night from 7 to 8.30, our youth service. And then the main auditorium, I'm teaching you know, on the letters of Peter right now in the main auditorium from 7 to 8.30. And by the way, we are on at SFLC for Sheffield Family Life Center, sflc.net. And you can see more of my teaching on Revelation by going down to the YouTube icon at FFLC at sflc.net and pushing on that because I taught it on Wednesday night. It's not as extensive as the book or not as extensive as my classroom, but I did teach it in 14 Wednesday nights live and I am live on Wednesday nights online. And if you're in the Kansas city area and you don't have a church home, we are having two services at Sheffield from nine o'clock. We have nine o'clock and 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and pastor George, my son, 
uh, he's the senior pastor now. I'm Pastor Emeritus. That means the old guy. Been at the same church 47 years. And, and my son will be preaching on Sunday. And we do spacing. Every other row is empty. We ask you to leave three spaces between people unless you're a family unit. Then you can sit together. The auditorium basically seats 3,000 people. We're having a few hundred people come right now. We still have plenty of room for more at both 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. We do do spacing in and out. We ask you to wear a mask in because it's a city ordinance, okay, that you wear a mask in. And then on the way out, we ask you to wear a mask. Once you're seated, you can wear it or not wear it. That's up to you because you won't be close to people. You make up your own mind about that. It's hard to sing with a mask on. And so... But what we do do spacing, and then we use the rows that have not been used for the second service. We block off the other rows. We're very, very careful. We have things. We have the wipes you can use to wipe off and everything when you come in. The offering we take on the way out on a box. We don't pass the offering thing. You can get a an envelope on the way in if you want one. And we do appreciate the people that have been supporting us online. Be sure and support your church now, now during this difficult time. I'm sure other churches like us, we have over 50 overseas missionaries we help support. And we have over 50 uh, ministries in this country we help support. Uh, it depends on each one of us doing our part to keep the work of God going on in spite of what's happening. So let God bless you and be faithful. And again, if you don't have a church home, look up Sheffield Family Life Center, Kansas City, Missouri, if you're in the Kansas City area. But you can find a Bible-believing church in your neighborhood, wherever you happen to be. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Send your questions in ahead of time to drgwwjr at gmail.com. God bless you. Amen. Have a great week in Jesus.